The next thing that we want to look at is how heat transfer relates to what we call a phase change or a change of phase. Now, in grade school, you probably learned that there are three main phases of matter. There are other phases that exist, but we're just going to worry about the main three. And those are solid, liquid, and you guessed it, gas. And we know that if you have a solid and you heat it up enough, it's going to melt and it's going to turn into a liquid. And that's called a phase change. That's actually called the melting phase change. Now, if I have a liquid and I heat it up, I keep heating it up, I put more and more heat into it, the liquid is all going to evaporate and turn into a gas. And so that would be another phase change, a change of phase from liquid into gas. Now, it can also go backwards. If I have a gas and I cool it down, it could convince, it could condense into a liquid. And so you have this liquid that has come out of the gas because it's been cooling off. Now, what's happening is these gas molecules are moving very, very fast. And uh, as you cool them down, they slow down, and they eventually can uh, come together and bond in such a way that they form a liquid. And then as you continue cooling them down, those uh, atoms and molecules move more slowly and the bonds are able to form and make it rigid like a solid. Same thing if you're starting at a solid, you heat it up, you're making the atoms and molecules go faster and faster, vibrating back and forth faster and faster. Some of those chemical bonds start breaking and so the solid turns into a liquid, you keep heating it up, eventually all the bonds break and you've got a gas. <clears throat> Now here we have some ideas about phase changes. So for example, we can consider the conversion of a liquid to a gas. This is uh, evaporation. So we're gonna look at the conversion of a liquid to a gas and that's called evaporation. Evaporation is a conversion of a liquid to a gas. It occurs at the surface of a liquid and basically what happens as these molecules are moving faster and faster, um, they break free and they're able to escape. And so molecular collisions between the atoms and molecules, they give some molecules enough energy to escape the fluid. And as the higher energy molecules leave, it leaves behind lower energy molecules. That actually creates a cooling effect. Evaporation is a process of cooling off. You, you put heat into something, you make the atoms and molecules move faster and faster. Now again, we're talking about a liquid here they're moving faster and faster. Well, the ones eventually, as they get fast enough, they escape. That leaves behind cooler molecules that are moving more slowly, and that cools down the liquid. You probably remember learning in school that we sweat in order to cool off. So your sweat glands produce sweat on the skin of your body, which evaporates, and that evaporation is a cooling process. That cools you off. Now, the phase change of condensation is going the other way. That's when you have a gas and you cool it down and it becomes a liquid. And so uh, condensation is the opposite of evaporation. And gas molecules near the surface of it, so you, basically the idea is this. I've got a liquid and at the surface of the liquid, these atoms are moving at a certain speed and there's also molecules of that liquid that have turned into a gas and are sort of floating up above. As these guys cool off, the ones near the surface to the liquid, they can get captured by the liquid. And so the molecules of that liquid in the air, they condense down into the liquid. Now, just like evaporation was a cooling process, condensation is a heating process because these fast moving molecules, when they get captured by the liquid, they have higher energy because they're moving faster. They add their energy to the liquid and so the liquid warms up. Now here's an example that maybe you've all experienced. If you've ever taken a shower, you might know that when you step outside the shower, it's kind of colder. Uh, I know that when I take a shower, I like to just kind of stay in the shower for a bit and start to towel off and dry inside the shower because it's nice and toasty in there. But why is it nice and toasty in there? 
It's because inside the shower, there's a lot of water vapor that's come off the water from the shower. And so there's a lot of water vapor. You're standing in the water vapor. That water vapor is condensing onto you, and that's a warming process. Whereas if you step out of the shower, you've got this water on, your, on the surface of your skin, and the air out here is much drier, so the water vapor is going to evaporate, and that cools you off. Now, evaporation is a process where the atoms and molecules leave the liquid and go into a gaseous state at the surface of a liquid. And that happens because of heat. As you're putting heat into the liquid, those atoms and molecules are vibrating faster and faster, and some of them get enough energy to leave. But if you put enough heat into the liquid, you can actually create boiling, which is kind of like evaporation on steroids. Evaporation only occurs at the surface of a liquid. Boiling can actually occur inside the liquid. And basically what happens when conditions are right, vaporization can occur throughout the whole volume of the liquid. Bubbles form inside the liquid, and then those bubbles, which are less dense, they'll float to the top, and that's when the gas will escape. And so you see in boiling water, you see the bubbles at the bottom of the pan, they rise up and they pop. That's basically what's happening. Now, here's basically what's happening. You have heat put into this pot, for example, and the pot contains water. And as the molecules shake back and forth, they form bubbles where there's uh, basically gas that's surrounded by the surface of the water. And that gas, because we know that if we heat up a gas, its pressure increases, the pressure of the gas inside the bubble is counteracting the pressure from the liquid and plus the atmospheric pressure pushing down on the liquid. And so uh, this process uh, is how the bubbles form. And then, of course, it's less dense, so it'll rise to the surface and it'll pop. And then some of that water that gets carried to the top has enough energy to escape. But there's a very important idea here that I don't want to gloss over. Boiling depends on temperature, yes. You obviously have to heat water up to boil it, usually. But it also depends on the pressure. You might have heard that if you want to boil an egg, like hard boil an egg, if you live in the mountains of Colorado, you have to boil them a little bit longer than if you live in, say, New Orleans. Well, why is that? Because we've already seen that if you go up to higher altitudes, the atmospheric pressure is less. And so what that means is there's less pressure pushing down from the atmosphere high in the mountains. And so you can get the bubble is able to balance the pressure of the water and the atmospheric pressure at a less amount of heat or at a lower temperature rather because the pressure is less. And so what that means is that water in the mountains will boil at a lower temperature than water at sea level. That's why you have to cook the egg longer in the mountains because the water temperature of the boiling water is a little bit lower. Now we have this idea that to make water boil, you have to put in a lot of heat. But you could also take away a lot of pressure. And it's a famous demonstration that you could, for example, take a pot of water like this, and instead of putting it on a burner, you could enclose it in a glass dome and suck all the air out of the glass dome. And as this atmospheric pressure gets less and less, room temperature would be enough to heat the water up to the boiling point. And so you can actually boil room temperature water just by removing the air, which is kind of cool. Now here's the one that's hard to wrap your brain around. Boiling is a process of evaporation. And so we know that evaporation is a cooling process. That means that boiling is a cooling process. And that seems so backwards. It seems like boiling is a heating process because to make water boil, usually you put heat into it, right? But what happens is you put the heat into it the boiling is carrying the heat away. It's taking those fast-moving molecules they are making the, the bubbles, and those bubbles are rising to the top and escaping. That's actually cooling the water off. And so that's why when you have water that's boiling, you're putting more and more heat into it, 
but the temperature of the water doesn't actually get any higher because the boiling process is cooling it off as to balance the heat that's going in. So as crazy as that might sound, boiling is a cooling process, which is kind of interesting, right? Now, I talked about boiling a hard boiled egg and the way that that works. Uh, we talked about how in the mountains that the air pressure is less high in the mountains and so water boils at a lower temperature. A pressure cooker does that backwards. A pressure cooker is a pan that's sealed and it creates more pressure. So in order to make the water boil, it has to actually boil at a higher temperature. So if you were, for example, boiling eggs in a pressure cooker, you could boil them faster than you could in a regular cooker. That's why pressure cookers are so neat, because they cook fast, they cook food really, really fast. Now, I mentioned that there was a famous demonstration where you could enclose some water, say, in a glass dome and you could suck all the air out and you could actually make that water boil at room temperature. We also said that boiling is a cooling process, so that boiling removes heat from the water. So one of the variations of that demonstration is you put a small amount of water here and you suck the air out so the water starts boiling and that can actually cool it off and cause ice crystals to form in the water as it's boiling. So by removing the air pressure, you can actually freeze and boil water at the same time. Is that crazy or what? Now we've talked about evaporation and condensation. That's going from a liquid to a gas and vice versa from a gas to a liquid. Now we're going to talk about melting and freezing. Melting occurs when a substance changes phase from a solid to a liquid, and freezing occurs when a substance changes phase from a liquid to a solid. Now, here's a nice twist on the idea of melting, because you might have, might have heard that when roads are icing over, one of the things that different cities or uh, towns will do is they'll put salt on the road to help get rid of the ice. And have you ever wondered why they do that? Why does the salt help get rid of the ice? Well, what it actually does is it helps the ice melt more quickly and at lower temperatures. So let's imagine that all right, we've got two, two situations here. We've got block A and block B here. And in block A, you have some ice and some liquid water over here. And what's happening is that some of the ice is melting and some of the water is freezing and this is happening at the same time and so this we're imagining this is at zero degrees which is the freezing point of ice or the melting point of ice rather and the freezing point of water and so you have zero degrees is where this occurs now imagine you add some salt to the water what's going to happen and you might have uh, learned this in chemistry if you ever took chemistry in high school but table salt the kind of stuff they're adding to the roads is made up of sodium which has a chemical symbol na and chlorine which has a symbol a chemical symbol cl and that particular combination of elements is called sodium chloride uh, that is table salt and what happens in uh, if you put table salt in water these atoms break up and you get sodium atoms and you get chlorine atoms just kind of floating and so you can kind of see that here so i've got my ice layer here and i've got my water layer here that i've added salt and you can see the sodium and the chlor chlorine atoms the yellow and the sort of brown or whatever color that is gray and they're floating in the water and what happens is that the presence of the sodium and chlorine atoms, they sort of make it harder for the water to get over into the ice. And so the ice, so more water molecules go from the ice to the water than from the water to the ice. And so over here, it was an equilibrium that for every atom that went one way, you had another atom or molecule rather going the other way. But here, it's much more one way, and so that leads to melting at that surface. What's happening 
is the salt in the water is actually making it harder for the water to form the kind of bonds it needs to become solidified. And that means that the freezing temperature of water with salt mixed into it is lower than the freezing temperature of pure water. And so that's why we put salt on ice on roads is because that means that the salt is going to melt at a lower temperature than it otherwise would. And if you're at a higher temperature, it's going to melt even faster. Now, it takes a certain amount of heat to melt a substance. So let's say I have a kilogram of, of some material and I want to melt it. I have to put a certain amount of heat into it. That amount of heat is called the latent heat. Now, if I have two kilograms of that material, I have to put in twice as much heat to melt twice as much mass. And if I put three times as much mass, I have to have three times as much heat. And so we define the idea of something called the latent heat in terms of a unit mass. And so that means for every kilogram of mass, that would be one unit of mass, it takes so much heat energy uh, in order to melt one kilogram. And that's called the latent heat of melting. Now, if you, take, if you have a liquid and you take that amount of heat away from it, what you're going to get is it's going to freeze. And that is called the latent heat of fusion. So that fusion process, the atoms and molecules fuse back together into the solid form. And so you have the latent heat of melting and the latent heat of fusion. They're going to have the same value, the same amount, but in one case you're melting and in the other case you're freezing. So lastly, we can put all this together and look at what's called a phase change diagram. Now, in my phase change diagram, I've got temperature and energy input. And specifically, this is going to be heat, heat energy input. So I'm adding heat. And so when I go over to the right, that means I've added more heat. And when I go up on this axis, it is temperature that we're talking about. So if I'm higher up, that means I'm at a higher temperature. And so what happens as you add more heat to a solid? Well, the temperature increases. And in fact, you might remember from last chapter, we know how the temperature increases. The quantity of heat you add is equal to mc times delta t. And the c is the specific heat, the m is the mass, and the delta t is the temperature change. And so if I add heat, I'm going to increase the temperature. You can see that the temperature is going up higher here as I go up that way. Now, then what happens is you start to melt. And as we said, melting is a process of breaking chemical bonds. And what's happening, you're adding heat, but that heat is no longer going into making the temperature rise. It's going into breaking the chemical bonds and melting the substance. But eventually, all of the substance will be melted and you'll have a liquid. And so as you continue adding more and more heat, the temperature of the liquid is going to rise. And again, we have this formula, mc delta t. And as we heat up this guy, we can see that the liquid is going to get hotter and hotter. And then eventually, you're going to get the phase change of vaporization. And it's basically going to boil. And so as it boils, Again, hotter and hotter, you're adding more and more heat. The temperature is not changing, though, because temperature means going upwards. And so what's happening is you're breaking the bonds of the liquid and converting into a gas. Once you've completely vaporized the liquid and converted it all into a gas, as you add more heat, the temperature of the gas increases. That's kind of a cool thing that... If you understand this phase change, this is called a phase change diagram. If you understand this, then you basically understand most of what we've talked about in this part of the lecture.